do you love me? And you can almost sense in Peter's response, he's a little annoyed by it. Jesus, you know that I love you. And I know all the nuances about the Greek words there, but it's not my purpose to go into all that today. But simply to say that Jesus came alongside of Peter after his failure, and three times he solicited a response from Peter to solidify the relationship that he had with him in love. Thirdly, replace our fear of others with love for others. When Peter answered the question that he loved the Lord, and he said, Lord, you know that I love you, Jesus told him to do something again three times. In a little different wording, he said, tend my sheep, feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. You say, what is that all about? Well, Jesus is saying to Peter, now, now that you've got it straight, now that you know where your loyalty lies, live out your life for others. And when you're so involved in serving God in the lives of other people, you don't have time to be afraid of what they say. Here's the dynamic here, you guys. If you're afraid of what people will say, there's no way you're ever going to be able to serve them. But if you know who God is and what he has done in your life and you're strong and secure in his approval of your life, you've maybe messed up, but you've sensed his forgiveness, now you're set free to help others and to be an encouragement to them. And in the very process of helping others, you strengthen your faith. I remember uh, thinking through this this past week, and I wrote down in my notes these words, when we love others, life is no longer about us, and the fear of disapproval is driven away. Amen. Number four, we can replace our fear of others with faith in him. Jesus now gives Peter a little forecast of his life. Peter's come through this test. He's now been forgiven. Now you think, well, now it's, he's going to sail right on into eternity with no issues. And no, the Lord Jesus said, Peter, I want you to know this. Now that you've come through this test, I want you to know life is not going to be easy for you. He said to him in John 21, 18 and 19, But Peter, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This Jesus spoke, signifying by what death Peter would glorify God. And if you know the story, the secular historians tell us how it happened. Peter was arrested and they crucified him, but before he was crucified, he requested that he be hung upside down because he did not believe that he was worthy to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was. He faced a lot of other tests. The Lord Jesus said to Peter, you're going to face some challenges. In essence, in the world you will have tribulation. But the rest of that is, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. We need to not be uh, naive about what we're facing in our world today, men and women. We've got to get it straight that our loyalty belongs to God or we'll be all over the place. Every week we are tested about this. Where do we stand with the Lord? I want to encourage you to take, take energy from Peter here. Peter was a man who failed, but he got it right, and he came back. And let me tell you what happened after that. Peter was a changed man. I remember uh, after a Monday night NFL football game back in 1990, something happened in the NFL for the very first time. Uh, the San Francisco 49ers and the New York Giants completed their game, and a group of eight players some from both teams gathered near the center of the field and they knelt on one knee and they prayed together in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. First time that it ever happened. And the practice caught on and soon other players began gathering on the field to pray after their games. And to no one's surprise, not everybody supported the idea of mixing your faith with football. Sports Illustrated, the iconic sports magazine, said the players should pray in private. NFL management considered prohibiting the practice, but the players made it known that they would not budge and that they would continue to pray after all the games, and some of them said, if you fine us, we will gladly pay the fine. So I've had to ask myself this question. If Peter were in the NFL, and I think he'd be a linebacker. I don't know about that. I don't know where that came from. I just thought that up. Here's the question. Would he maintain his faith in the face of media and spectator disapproval? Would he have? In the beginning, he would not. In the beginning, he would not. In the beginning, you would have never seen him out there on one knee praying after a football game. But after God got done with him and after he saw what had happened, I believe at the end, he would have led the prayer meeting, don't you? 
he would have been standing up with both hands up in the air and saying, bring it on. And the reason I know that is because after Peter was restored by the Lord and took a new look at what God had called him to do, he was a changed person. I don't have time to tell you all that happened except that with the other disciples, he preached a powerful sermon to the massive crowds in Jerusalem who were gathered on the day of Pentecost. And when he got done, he gave this he gave this conclusion to his sermon. See if this sounds like Peter before or Peter after. Here's what he said. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the Bible says the, the sermon was so powerful that people came from everywhere and 3,000 souls were converted on that day. And the Bible says later on as he was preaching that they watched him and Acts 4.13 says when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Listen, the boldness of this man who was afraid. When they saw his boldness, they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men and they marveled. Here's Peter failing because of his fear. And here's Peter excelling because of his faith. And we have to live our lives out in one of the two ways, don't we? We either live in fear or we live in faith. I can't tell you that you can reproduce Peter's journey. None of us can. All of us will experience some of the emotions that Peter experienced. But what I can tell you is this. We can, every one of us, ask for the boldness of Peter. We can ask God to give us boldness in our lives as confined as that may seem to us, I promise you sometime this week, whatever you do, wherever you go, you will have an opportunity to declare your faith. You won't have to push it on anyone. You will just have to be normally a Christian, and you will be tempted to water it down. Have you ever watched people pray in a restaurant who aren't sure whether they want to or not? They wet their head like this and say a quick prayer. I believe when we get to heaven, we're going to find out the shortest prayers ever prayed were prayed in a restaurant. <laughs> On the other hand, I had a friend that used to preach for me years ago who thought that he should make up for all of this by standing up in the restaurant and praying for the whole restaurant to hear, which was not, not the right thing to do either. I never wanted to go eat with him because uh, I just... Why don't you come over to the house? We'll have a sandwich at my house tonight, right? <laughs> On the other hand, have you ever been in a restaurant where you saw a family, maybe a mom and dad, two or three kids, and without making a big deal out of it, they just join hands around the table, and before they eat, they say a prayer. And I'll tell you what, I almost want to cry every time I see it because I see it less and less than I used to. Men and women, we don't have to be ashamed of our faith. We don't have to be bull-nosed about it, or um, we don't have to be belligerent or obnoxious, but we need to stand up for what we believe. And we can't let this secular culture in which we live push us around and make us something that we're not. We are children of the king. We can stand with our hands up and our heads up high, and we can go on. So when you're tempted to be afraid of disapproval, just remember who approves you. And the one who approves you is the only approval you really need. Here's how it works. If you are in the right fear relationship with God, you need fear no man. If you know who God is, and you understand how important he is, and if God has approved you, you don't need anybody else's approval. If God is for us, who can be against us? So with that confidence in our hearts, let's don't cower when the pressure's on. Let's live for God with joy in our hearts, and you can do it in such a natural way. Declare your faith as you have opportunity. Don't have to be ashamed of it. The greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life is when I met Jesus Christ as my Savior. Why would I want to bury that under the debris of all the other things that happened to me? I want it to be top, on top. I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Thank God he wasn't ashamed of me. A geographical prophecy. History was humming in the air like electricity on May 14, 2018. A blue ribbon crowd assembled in front of the new American Embassy in Jerusalem. 
The event coincided with the 70th birthday of the State of Israel. The weather was mild and sunny, and the gallery was filled with sunglasses and smiles. After years of vacillation, the United States of America was officially moving its ambassador and diplomatic staff to the true capital of the Jewish state, to Jerusalem. Amen. There were 800 guests in attendance that day, including members of the United States Congress, the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State, members of the Trump family, the U.S. Ambassador to Israel, the Middle East Peace Envoy, representatives of 33 other countries, pastors and rabbis, and of course, Israel's President and Prime Minister. Standing in the sunshine before giant flags of the United States and Israel, an emotional Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, punched the podium with his finger and exclaimed, what a glorious day. Remember this moment. This is history. Well, I've had the privilege of visiting Jerusalem many times. And each occasion has been memorable. As you drive in from the east, the sight just takes your breath away. Emerging from a tunnel, your attention leaps to the left. There, shimmering in the sunshine, is the Temple Mount, the Wailing Wall, the glistening Dome of the Rock, the El Osk Mosque, the Mount of Olives, Church of the Holy Sepulcher. The walls around the old city reflect a golden hue, and at night they're burnished with an eerie glow from great spotlights. The sight of these walls, day or night, almost brings tears to your eyes. This is the old city of Jerusalem. By moving the United States Embassy to this hallowed city, the United States made an historic statement in support of Israel, illustrating a unique union between two of the greatest democracies on planet Earth. Since then, other nations have moved their embassies to Jerusalem. Though the decision to do so is controversial, in fact, as you probably remember, everybody predicted it would create a war, which it did not do. It certainly asks a lot of questions and begs some answers. So here is the question. Why should there be such a deep emotion about a piece of real estate no bigger than the state of New Jersey? Why should love and hatred for Jerusalem be so strong? One answer is that Jerusalem is bound up with prophecies from Almighty God. I can hardly believe that I was privileged to be alive when the state of Israel was reborn in 1948. I was seven years old. Now I have had the privilege of watching another prophetic domino fall with yet another elevation of Jerusalem. In the words of prophetic writer Randall Price, Jerusalem is now set to become God's stage for the final drama. The city of Jerusalem, as you know, is sacred to Christianity, sacred to Judaism, and sacred to Islam. It's the world's most significant city, and it's mentioned in the Bible 811 times. Now that might not sound so awesome to you until I tell you that the second most mentioned city in the Bible is Babylon. It's mentioned 200 and some times. Once you realize how prominent Jerusalem is, you'll see it everywhere. Almost every place you turn, there's something being said about Jerusalem. It is God's city. Population of Jerusalem is growing. It is moving toward a million people. When Jesus was on this earth, 75,000 people lived in Jerusalem. And according to the Bible, I don't know if you know this, there's a special blessing that resides upon anybody who is born in Jerusalem. Here's what it says in Psalm 87. And of Zion, or Jerusalem, it will be said, this one and that one were born in her, and the Most High himself shall establish her. The Lord will record when he registers the people. Did you know that there are people who, when they find out they're pregnant, go to Jerusalem so their children can be born under the blessing of God? because there is a special blessing upon those who are born in Jerusalem. Don't ask me to explain it. I'm just reporting it. So Jesus loved Jerusalem. On one occasion, he stood outside of Jerusalem, and we read this in Matthew 23. He prayed, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, 
how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Jesus loved Jerusalem, and he cried over Jerusalem because of their, their unwillingness to accept him as their Messiah. And if you study the history of the early church, you know that it all started in Jerusalem. The Bible says we're to take the gospel to the whole world, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. Jerusalem is the center of world evangelism, according to the book of Acts. Now, there's several main reasons why Jerusalem is so important and why it's such a constant subject, even in the secular news. First of all, Jerusalem is a central city. Jerusalem is the center of Israel in the same way that your heart is the center of your body. No city on earth has captured the world's attention throughout all the centuries like the city of Jerusalem. Ezekiel the prophet put it this way. He said, this is Jerusalem. I have set her in the midst of the nations and the countries all around her. Yes, Jerusalem is the city in the center. It is the center of man's hopes and God's purposes. God loves Jerusalem. Satan hates Jerusalem. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit descended into Jerusalem. The nations are drawn to Jerusalem. And one day Christ will return to Jerusalem and reign over the city. Indeed, the destiny of the world is tied to the future of Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a central city. Here's something I didn't realize at the depth that I now realize it. Jerusalem is a chosen city. Do you know that Jerusalem was chosen specifically by God for her role in the history of Israel, in the life of Jesus, and in the events of his return? According to 1 Kings 8.44, Jerusalem is the city which God has chosen. In Deuteronomy chapter 12, five times we are told that God chose Jerusalem for his name. This is God's city, the city of Jerusalem, set in a place like no other city. Here's a passage that uniquely helps you to understand that. This is Second Chronicles 6, 5 through 6. You might want to write this passage down. Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, God is speaking, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house. And my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people. In other words, God said, since the beginning of time, I never selected any city. There was no special city. But I have selected Jerusalem. Jerusalem is my chosen city. Jerusalem has my special blessing upon it. It's the city that has my name connected to it. And it helps me to understand what happens to me when I go to Jerusalem. I've been going there now for a number of years, and I've tried to explain even to my wife how when I walk into that city, it's like a spell comes over me. It's sort of almost surreal. In those moments, it's like I've got one foot in the past and the other in the future. And the walls and the buildings are made of a kind of pale golden limestone that's used a lot in the United States even now. It's called Jerusalem stone. There's always just a whiff of tension in the city of Jerusalem because everybody knows that the ground beneath their feet is the powder keg of the earth. I don't feel unsafe in Jerusalem. That's not it. I mean, everywhere you look, somebody's got a rifle slung over their shoulder. It's the most armed city I've ever been in. Everybody who's in Jerusalem, if you're a citizen of Jerusalem, if a young person in Jerusalem, you're in the army. You're a soldier. You don't get to ask to be in the army. You are. And the reason they're able to protect themselves so wonderfully when they're attacked is the whole city is, is ready to respond. It's the most prepared city to protect itself that I've ever been in. And there are places in Jerusalem where I literally walk where Jesus walked. We see some of the locations when we go there where Jesus performed his miracles, where he debated his enemies, where he faced his execution. Most of all, I love going to the quiet beauty of the garden tomb and visualizing how it must have been on Resurrection Day. So I've spent my whole life studying and teaching the Bible. And when I'm in Jerusalem, it's as though I were jumping through its pages, transported to the very scenes of action. I hope you've been there. If you haven't, I hope you go. When you come home, the Bible is never the same. You read something in the scripture. Oh, I was there. 
I walked on that place. But having said all of that, I still haven't explained to you why I now understand I have such an overwhelming aura when I go to Jerusalem. I've discovered something that goes far beyond emotions and enjoyment. Men and women, as never before, I've realized that Jerusalem belongs to God as no other city ever has or ever will. There's a biblical sense in which Jerusalem is eternal. It will never die. Jerusalem is God's own unique eternal city. And that fact, more than any other, explains the wonder of the holy city to me. When I go there, I'm walking in God's city. I'm moving around in the city chosen by the Almighty. So Jerusalem's a central city and it's a chosen city. It's also a capital city. Jerusalem became the capital of Israel by decree of King David over 3,000 years ago. And it's remained Israel's capital ever since. Other nations have conquered and settled in the land of Israel, but no one has ever declared Jerusalem their capital. Over the past 2,000 years, even during times of occupation and persecution, a Jewish community has resided in Jerusalem and maintained it as their eternal capital. For many years, American opinion spoke in favor of moving the United States Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, and politicians agreed. Presidential candidates promised to do it. In October of 1995, the U.S. Congress called for the move to occur by May 1999, but one after another, our American presidents deferred, citing the fear of security considerations should they do such a thing. But in June of 2017, the United States Senate unanimously passed a resolution 90 to nothing that reaffirmed the 1995 congressional decision and called upon the president to implement it. And six months later, President Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital and moved the embassy away from Tel Aviv. And critics whined and complained, saying he should have used the issue to work with the Palestinians. But in short, the embassy was relocated to an area in western Jerusalem where Israel commands total sovereignty, and it is now in Jerusalem where you will find the United States Embassy. With that event, another key has been turned in the grand lock of biblical prophecy, and I'll explain what I mean. Here's the answer to that question, what does this mean? The second advent of Jesus Christ cannot happen without Jerusalem. Almost all the Christ-centered events in the future will take place in Jerusalem. Without Jerusalem, these events would be impossible. Were I living in Jerusalem today, if I was a citizen of Jerusalem, I would take these prophecies with a great sense of reassurance because they assume the continual existence of this city, a fact that seems at odds with the threats she continually faces every day. Every time I've gone to Jerusalem, I've had the opportunity to preach on the southern steps of the temple. I looked over to my right, and I could see the Mount of Olives, the hilltop where Jesus ascended to heaven at the close of his gospel ministry. To this very place, we are told in the prophetic scripture, Jesus will come again. He will come again, and his feet will touch the Mount of Olives from which he went back to heaven. Not only will Christ return to Jerusalem at his second advent, but that city will be the seat from which he reigns on the earth during the whole millennium. The thousand-year period of Christ's rule on the earth will take place, and it will be centered where? In Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be the Messiah's millennial capital and the home of a temple in which the sacrifices will be memorial. That's only the beginning. The everlasting capital city of Jesus throughout eternity will be Jerusalem. In the Bible, we call it the New Jerusalem. Earthly Jerusalem, to which Jesus will return and from where he will reign a thousand years, is the prelude to another Jerusalem, a city whose foundations and builder is God. The New Jerusalem is the city we read about in the Bible in Revelation 20 and 21. The Bible says in 21 too, the holy city, the New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. And men and women, this is a real city. The final two chapters of the Bible use the word city 11 times to describe the New Jerusalem. This isn't a figure of speech. This is not some spiritual thing. 
let's face it, because our resurrection bodies are going to be real, the body of Jesus was real after he came out of the grave, we're going to have resurrection bodies just like Jesus had. Because our bodies will be real, we're going to need a real place to live, a real place in which to function. And the New Jerusalem will be just that. It will be a physical location. In the book of Revelation, we have our fullest glimpse of the details of that city. It is the capital city of heaven. And I want to read to you a rather extended section of Revelation chapter 21, so you can remember what the Bible says about this place, our eternal home. Now, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Now that's a long section, but this description implies the holy city was designed and built and made ready for the earth. And John didn't see the New Jerusalem being created. It exists now. The New Jerusalem is heaven. It's where my parents are. It's where many of your loved ones are. It's where we go when we die. It's the New Jerusalem. It's in heaven. But the Bible says in the end times, it will descend to this earth, this four square city. And a lot of people say, well, how could that city be big enough to handle all the Christians who are going to be there? People who ask that question probably are overestimating how many Christians are going to be there. <laughs> and they're underestimating the incredible volume of space in a four-square city, the city of my God. So try this exercise. What do you think this is going to look like? I'm going to give you a little experience this morning. Think of the most beautiful spot you've ever seen on planet Earth. For me, it's an island in the Aegean Sea called Santorini. Here it is. I've been there twice. It's an amazing city because it's built on the top of a volcano that obviously is dead, and everything is white. And when you're in a ship coming toward the city, it's up high. You have to take an escalator to get up there. And when you see it, I remember saying to Donna, oh, it looks like we're floating toward heaven. That's what it looks like. And it is a beautiful city, unbelievable. As we stood on the deck of the ship and looked at the white little town with its rounded roofs and quaint simplicity, it looked like it was suspended in space. But ladies and gentlemen, as breathtaking as Santorini is, it's nothing compared to the beauty of the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem will be so overwhelming, you will not be able to take it in in one breath. What's happened in Jerusalem now is a prediction of the Jerusalem that is to come. Jerusalem in Israel is a city which in essence never ends. It's an eternal city. The old Jerusalem will be replaced by the new Jerusalem and continue on forever and ever. When you see the new Jerusalem, you'll be overjoyed with its beauty. That's the first thing I want you to think about. The Bible describes the new Jerusalem as a city built on a foundation of precious stones. Entry into the city will be through gates of pearl and the streets will be paved with gold, the light of the city will come from the Lamb of God himself, who is the light of the world. Near the city center you'll find the tree of life, which has been missing since the book of Genesis and chapter 3. The inhabitants of the city will be able to eat the leaves of the tree of life, and those leaves will somehow provide a deeper sense of our well-being in heaven. In the heart of the city is the river of life, which will come from beneath the throne of God and flow through the landscape and delight the whole earth. This will be a beautiful river. So you'll be overjoyed with its beauty. You'll be overwhelmed with its holiness. Three times in Revelation 21 and 22, John calls the new Jerusalem a holy city. 
The Wycliffe Bible Commentary says that a holy city will be one in which no lie will be uttered in 100 million years. No evil word will ever be spoken. No shady deal will ever be discussed. No unclean picture will ever be seen. No corruption of life will ever be manifest. It will be holy because everyone in it will be holy. In fact, John lists eight kinds of people who will never step foot inside the gates of the New Jerusalem. Here they are in Revelation 21.8. The cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, all liars. They shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So when you see the New Jerusalem, you'll be overwhelmed by its beauty. When you enter the city, you'll be overwhelmed by its holiness. And I say that today with some context for where we are now. Is there any place where you can go today that's truly holy, where it hasn't been touched by the icy fingers of sin? Oh, there's some good places. I hope this is one of them. But while this church is filled with good people, it's not holy. Because sitting in this room today, among us, maybe you're one of them, is unholiness. But when you get to heaven, there won't be anything that's unholy. Everything will be perfectly holy. There will be no sin, no thought of sin, no death, no sickness, no crying, no sorrow. None of the results of sin that we experience in the world today, none of that will be present. And so the New Jerusalem will overjoy you with its beauty. It will overwhelm you with its holiness. And it will overcome you with its Savior.